Chapter 17, we are going to do some work on designing cloud-based solutions. So kind of interesting on how we're going to do this because we really do want to compare and contrast functional and non-functional system requirements. If you've ever done any kind of development, you know that this is a baseline thing that we need to do. What do we want it to do? How do we want it to do it? What do we want it to look like? You need to understand why developers should delay selecting an implementation platform during the design phase because really you just want to focus on what the components are going to do and how they're going to interoperate with each other and then discuss considerations designers should evaluate when they design a system to meet specific non-functional requirements. So this is really a big part of what we do. This is more when you get into software and systems level design. This is the fun part of the job, building cool stuff. And this is where the cloud really kind of shines on this one. So before you begin the design process, ensure you have a complete set of system requirements. Anyone that's ever tried to do requirements gathering at a company knows that this is nearly impossible to have a complete set of system requirements. The best thing you can do is try to hit about 80%, do an 80-20 rule, and then keep your scope straight. Right? Figure out what it is you really, really need to do and then stick to scope. You're going to have a million people that are going to try to scope creep you. They're going to want something different. They're going to want to go, why didn't you talk to me when you did? There's going to be a lot of pushback on what you're building. But if the requirements are defined by another group or review, make sure you understand them. Make sure that you really understand them. Make sure you know what you're building. You know, ideally, you're going to have a senior level a leader who's the champion of the product. Ideally, you're going to have stakeholders who will serve as the expert on those requirements specification. That will be part of your build team. You really do want to have these people. If they provided input into your system requirements, they need to be part of the QA team. They need to be part of the beta testers. They need to be part of the alpha testers. Make sure they're there and testing. Make sure they have the time to test. Right. That way, if you identify any errors, omissions, or misunderstandings early in the design process, it's going to save you a lot of time and money later on. Now, the good part is that if you do a standard modular design inside the cloud, if you do a serverless environment, if you're doing functions, a lot of that process in terms of CI, CD is actually going to be pretty straightforward. You are going to be spending money on it, but it's not going to be that much to fix little emissions and little errors. It's when you build the wrong product for your company that this turns into a real interesting process. So there's kind of two categories of requirements, and hopefully you guys know that. That functional requirements specify what the system does, right? Normally. You're going to get this from the business workflow. You're going to have to understand how that system or business analyst passes data back and forth or how it works on data or how it manipulates data, how it stores it, how it's used, how it's presented to the user. Those are all the functional requirements. What does the business workflow for that system look like? And that can turn into a huge, huge thing. Right, you're going to have a whole bunch of flow diagrams. You may have a work breakdown structure that ties to that. You may have a lot of things that go into that functional requirement. Now, the non-functional requirements to specify how the system will work behind the scenes. You know, basically quality, performance, reliability, maintainability, all those other things that make that system uh, available to make sure that we can still use it. So the things it does, the things it needs to do for that work process for that business process and you may actually be at the business process level and interacting with multiple systems and multiple people along the way and then again how do we keep it going how do we performance how is it reliable maintainability for non-functional so remember that functional versus non-functional now they're going to tell you to delay selecting a development environment and that is probably a really true statement it depends on where you're at and what company you're working for. Your design goal is to understand the requirements. So you don't want to start specifying, well, we're going to build it on a Windows box or an Apple box or a Linux box. You may actually need to do a shared environment. There may be things that work more functionally better on a Linux box than they work on a Windows box. Now, there's different flavors of Windows. What happens if you want to use Windows Server without a GUI? That's a completely different paradigm shift. It's great because they really spin up really fast. You don't have to worry about the attack surface for the graphical user interface or anything else than that. But you don't want to be specifying any of that stuff when you're trying to figure out how the work actually happens in a business process. Right? If you focus on platform capabilities right away, that platform is going to start dictating your design. Now, whether you're inside the cloud or whether you're inside your own data center, you just need to understand how the business functions and where that product or service originates from, how it works all the way through the systems 
so that you can just build what makes sense. Going to the cloud gives you a real big opportunity to go back and take a look at decades of system processes that may no longer make sense or can be significantly streamlined. You know, we've all made jokes about the server in the closet that no one knows about, and God forbid it goes down because the whole company will go down because that server was built in 1992 and the people that don't know how it works anymore, right? That's kind of part of what we're trying to do here when you move something to the cloud and that whole workflow for that whole product or that whole service it gives you the opportunity to identify all those servers and closets that no one knows about or no one knows how they work anymore because the people who built them and designed them no longer work for the company. It gives you a real opportunity to redesign that business process and that business workflow to a more modern standard. That can save you an awful lot of money. It can be really expensive up front depending on what you've got. It can also be pretty cheap if you go more for platform or if there's a software as a service solution for whatever you're trying to do. You know, there's ways of making the cloud work for you in such a way that you can save lots of money. But if you're focusing on the hardware and software first, you're not really looking at the business process as a workflow. You're looking at little components along the way. Again, redesigning your whole workflow to become more cloud native can really save you a lot of money and really modernize your work your workflows, which is huge in terms of cross saving. Now, again, design, give and take. If anyone says it has to be this way and it has to be this way only, kind of go back and question why, right? So designing a system is challenging. Boy, you are going to get a lot of feedback. You're going to get a lot of people that says it has to be this way. You're going to get a lot of people saying, well, we've always done it this way. And budget and time constraints means you cannot solve every problem. Focus on the workflow. Focus on modernizing that workflow. And understand you're going to be crossing a lot of political and power barriers along the way. Because you're going to be looking at from customer through manufacturing to finance to accounting to business unit to however it goes in the company. So you've got to consider common design issues, help the stakeholders prioritize those solutions, and then remember the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your program's processing takes within 20% of the code. You're going to want to focus on system design. That will produce the greatest impact for all of the stakeholders. That can be really politically sensitive to do. So give and take, just be prepared to give and take, be prepared for a bunch of things to become really political super fast that make no sense for the design that you're building, it makes no sense for the workflow, but for how the company operates politically it makes perfect sense. Just be ready for that. It's gonna be a thing, it's gonna be a big thing. It may be something that stops you dead in your tracks for a couple of days while everyone tries to figure it all out and that's okay. All right, this is a, we're all a big group here. We're all a big collaborative group here. And there are political boundaries and political barriers to any new system that you build and design and install. You also want to design for accessibility, right? So public solutions such as consumer, you want to maximize user access so that you can get everyone in there, including Americans with Disabilities Act. All right, so make sure that you've got an opportunity to really go through and design for ADA. Make sure you've got popovers. Right, so when you have a highlighted section, you can actually hold your mouse over it and you'll see that you know, there'll be a popover, learn more or whatever on that. You'll also notice that a lot of websites now, uh, especially in education, you have something you read, something you listen to, something you can watch. All of that is ADA accessibility issues. Right? We generally know that these things work, but we wouldn't do them to such the extent that we do them now if it wasn't for the Americans with Disability Act. So federal law will define some of the things that you need to do so that you can be compliant. And compliancy is a lot better than a fine down the road because we've had people build websites that are really super cool but weren't accessible by everybody. So you have to build accessibility in right away. Make sure you're working with someone that understands how ADA works. And again, it's just simple things like popovers, uh, words, uh, voice navigation, other things that may come between the user's device versus what you actually have to have your website do on the fly for people. So ADA is an interesting process. Just make sure you've got someone handy for that. Now, our real world solution, voice pay, cloud-based user authentication. So authentication on a mo mobile device can be kind of painful. Often mobile users will pre-configure different pages to remember them. Oh yeah, we do that. We cache all of our passwords. If you've gone into your Google password manager, man, you probably got two or 300 in there now and you don't even know who half those websites are because you visited them once and you logged in underneath your Google login. So 
If a user loses, loses that device, though, it can become really painful because now you have cached information inside your cell phone, whether that's your bank account, your credit card, if you're using Apple Pay, any of that stuff. You know, again, I'm a big fan of remote wipe, so make sure that you can do this. So voice pay kind of gives you uh, the ability to fix that and gives you built-in processes that will help you understand how to delete your device along the way. So voice-based biometric authentication along the way. So my voice will activate my phone. The only problem is if I'm sick, if I'm stressed, or if my voice does not meet the parameters. So say I'm in a car wreck and I'm screaming call 911, uh, my voice pay won't work because I don't fall within the tolerances or specifications of where my voice normally is. Again, colds are horrible for voices, um, sleep deprivation, horrible for voices. So you can use this, but it's an interesting biometric solution to your phone. That can make sense. And it can actually really work well. It also doesn't mean, though, I can't pre-record the voice. There's all sorts of ways of breaking this. It's just neat from a security viewpoint. When you come in from a security viewpoint, your goal here is to break everything that your company wants you to bring in and figure out what the risk around that is. All I have to do is speak. I can record your voice on a normal day. And there it is. Web Accessibility Initiative. I like these guys. These are actually really, really good. So we're going to help designers understand potential solution and user needs across the World Wide Web. So there's guidelines now for web accessibility pages. And before you design a user interface, you should really know what those are. I'm a big fan of accessibility. I think they're great. It's really interesting, especially from an educational viewpoint, how people use web pages, how they use web products. When you're dealing with ESL, students will often go back and review these 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 recordings they'll go back and they'll play sections that they didn't understand or didn't catch up on people when they're listening to a lecture like this will actually tune in and tune out you're going to listen for a minute i'll say something really super cool like ferraris are amazing and then you'll tune in and you go why did he say ferraris are amazing and then you'll tune out again Maybe your lecturer has, oh, this is a great lecture. I love lecturing. Lecturing is the best thing because, you know, Active Directory is a beautiful thing and so is accessibility. You know, maybe you've got someone who's talking in a monotone. There's all sorts of reasons for a lecture to fail. You can be in a lecture hall with 500 people tuning in and out. You can be sitting in your living room trying to listen to a video because the instructor is saying something important and you're writing down sheets of notes and you tune out and you lose, miss a critical point. So, all this stuff will help your users have a better experience. And this is one of the reasons why I really love online lectures like this, because you can go back and you can replay sections that you missed. So that accessibility initiative, make sure you are comfortable with ADA compliance. If you need help, get help from your legal team, get help from a specialist in this field, but it's an amazingly good thing to do for people, right? And then the other thing you want to do too is design for audit. Right. You want to make sure that you're identifying critical processing points. So you're going to want to place some kind of internal control, whether that's login, whether that's payment, whether that's checkout, whether that's shipping and delivery, whether that's inventory control. You're going to want to make sure that you've got some kind of internal control at each point in that work breakdown structure, in that work business process flow that says, I need to tie in this audit here and then have an audit dashboard. Right? You can design controls to be active, which means you're going to do some kind of processing exception if something happens, or the control may be passive, just basically logging events to a file and then pushing it out to a dashboard. People will love you if you do this. And again, your ability to move into the cloud when you're designing for the cloud gives you that opportunity to rebuild that entire workflow. And you can put audit parts in there, and it will just make your life easier. If you do it now, if you're doing it on design, you're going to make sure that you've got all your controls. You're not going to have to go back and try to do this later. Retrofitting is painful. If you design all this stuff up front, inside, you can get all the feedback, all the things that you need to know, all the things that other people need to know, and you can just build those dashboards as you go. You can build those audit points inside your solution and make everybody happy. You also want to design for availability. You've heard me talk about how great multi-zone, multi-region, and high availability architectures are. And that's because you can build for availability today 
and not have to worry about co-location, not have to worry about trying to provision another data center, not worrying about all the things that would go into any kind of disaster recovery, business continuity, or anything else. You can just simply start designing for it right now, do a VPN or peer-to-peer -peer connection between the two zones, share data back and forth, and you are up and running, right? So again, for most of us, 99.9% .9 uptime is acceptable, right? I can lose 525 minutes every year. I won't blink at that. I won't even probably notice on any of the websites that I own, right? Now, for Amazon, that's different. That 525 minutes a year can be $52 million or more of lost time. So they need a bigger uptime. But for most of us, man, that availability, 99.9% .9 is great. We just have to design for failover. And that's really easy to do in the cloud and just have to plan for it. And if you plan for it and you do it and you do it right, you're going to have the most stable system in the cloud without a whole lot of money and having to provision a second data center. So, and then you want to design for backups. So backups are important, especially when you're trying to figure out how often, what do you want to do? Do you want to just snapshot your ECSs? Do you want to just snapshot the data that's in your Elastic Block Storage or an Elastic File System? Move that over to your S3. How do you want to do this? So backups are important. So is data lifecycle and everything else you have to do with this. Now the good part is that you can actually do synced replication across the multi-zone, multi-region. You don't need to have a backups, you just have to have synced replication. Backups are always good to have though, because it just gives you an opportunity that something fails bad, or gives you the opportunity to bring down a snapshot if something got corrupted or something got hacked. You can work from a backup or you can work from a snapshot you have the ability to go back in and go and fix something really, really quickly on the fly. So you're always going to have a cost versus risk trade-off on this one. It's going to be up to the company on how they do data life cycles, how they do active data versus stored data versus archival data. How do they want to do archival data? Do you want to back up archival data? Where do you want to back up archival data to? And then all these other things. You've probably, if you work in a company, already have some kind of data life cycle going on. Just follow that plan if you're in a startup you're going to have to design that backup process and that data retention lifecycle for your backups and for your active data and all the other data that you're working on. But the cool part is you can do that here and you can do that now, especially when you're moving into the cloud. You have that opportunity again to really look at the rules and policies, plans and procedures for that company. And do they make sense for the cloud? All right, they may make perfect sense for your data center, but they may not make perfect sense for the cloud. Now, design for future and existing capacity, right? So if you're moving an existing on-site solution to the cloud, you've got to monitor your application all the way through, which is where that design for audit comes in. If you put in something in place and you notice that it's choke holding on your serverless Lambda solution, then you can start working on that. If it's choking on your Docker cluster or if it's working on your ECS is having a problem or whatever, you can actually track all that. The cool part is that the cloud will give you, everyone's got a feature like X-Ray, where you can actually go through step function your program and see if there's a programmatic issue or whether it's a capacity issue. Most capacity issues are going to show up in the dashboard as high utilization, whether that's network, net, uh, RAM, or server, or something else. And you can just set a trigger environment for that so you can do some scalability, build out a second set of your system so that you can increase your capacity. It can really work but you have to design for it. You have to have some kind of ability to scale and you have to have the templates in place to scale automatically. You don't want to try to scale manually. You want to take advantage of the cloud and automation, right? Scale and descale as you need to. Elasticity is a beautiful thing to have. And then make sure that you are doing a thing. So there's actually two kinds of scaling here. First, you can scale the application up so you basically are moving the application to a faster, more powerful processor. This all depends if you've got a single, single application running. I've seen more horizontal scaling where we're just going to distribute everything across different servers. So we'll have an environment for logins. We'll have an environment for databases. We'll have an environment for network, firewall load balancing, DNS, and everything else. We'll horizontally scale as things happen, and then we'll horizontally descale as things happen. So your elasticity can either give you a bigger hardware or give you more hardware. Most of the ones I've seen is more hardware more low cost, cheap hardware, most on the tier two free level, especially if I don't need a whole lot of IOPS, if I'm not doing high performance computing, 
man, just treating my servers as disposable really makes life a lot easier and can actually save me money, especially if I'm working at a T2 or a tier level, which is really super small. Work it through all the way through. <coughs> then you want to design for configuration management. Ideally, cloud-based solutions will be used at any time, any place with any device. So plan for mobile access, plan for desktop access, plan for all those things on how people will access content nowadays. Most of us are going to access it through our cell phones now. Some of us are going to access it through desktops. It depends on where you're at. Your developers need to figure out what they want to design for. You're going to have device-specific graphical user interfaces. You're going to have operating systems and browsers. You're going to have people that are going to come through with something insecure. There's going to be patches, security issues. And then each time we release a new version, we're going to have to go through that process, right? So if you're designing your own solution, you're going to want to layer configuration solutions on top of your system. There's actual templates for that. There's ways of managing configuration management. There's ways of locking configuration management. So changes just can't be made randomly on the fly by unknown people. There's a lot of things you can do here in the cloud for management and configuration management and governance of that management process. So whatever solution you go into, AWS, Google, Azure, they'll all have very similar things, but you just need to figure out how the specific tools and functions work within the cloud environment that you actually choose and then design for deployment. So you're all proud of, proud, you built your beautiful application. It works, it's past QA, it's past security, it's past all of its testing, it's done all the things, and now you need to deploy it, all right? So we can do that deployment actually fairly easy depends on how you built your network right but as you're designing your solution you should identify each potential user type in the environment that it has you can actually have your QA in a virtualized desktop that are actually poking at your application so you could actually be running all the versions of Windows or Apple or Linux that you're going to support in that virtual environment you can do all of your browser based testing and everything else along the way so when you're designing for deployment, you're actually designing in your QA is building out virtualized environments so they can actually replicate the user experience regardless of the device that they're on. So consider not only how you would deploy your initial solution, but you can keep that test environment together and store it off and then spin it up every time you deploy a system upgrade. So you can build a QA environment and then build it QA test turn it off and then next time you make a change turn that environment back on again you can actually have a template for that QA environment for all the devices all the desktops and everything else in a virtualized desktop system on a virtualized server boom you're good to go it's a neat way of designing for deployment and test and test harnessing it's just a nice way of designing for that so make sure that when you get into QA or you get into security you're actually designing in that deployment part of it. And then again, my big one, designing for disaster recovery and business continuity. You will always hear me say, what's our solution for that? You will always hear me say, what's our disaster recovery? Why aren't we doing multi-zone, multi-region deployments? Now, it's really unlikely that the whole world is going to turn off in, in any moment. So the cloud is a really affordable and distributable resources, provide developers with a lot of flexibility and a lot of flexibility for governance, management, and everybody else. So just make sure that you're in multi-zone, multi-region, however you want to do it, better experience for the customers, better experience for you. And then all of a sudden your people can be anywhere in the world managing your systems for you. You're in good shape. You really are designed for this, right? And then designing for the environment. So this one's really big, right? Everybody now wants to see environmentally friendly IT operations. And unless you're doing something really weird, the cloud's actually pretty green. A lot of cloud computing data centers right now are working off of solar. So you can actually reduce your carbon footprint by moving to the cloud. And that may be something important later on down the road, but it certainly looks good for your for your employees and your customers right now, if you can raise your green score for your company up a little bit by moving to the cloud, and it's customers will like it, and it's not going to cost you anything. Honestly, you're not going to have to build out your solar installation. That's already going to be done for you by the company that you're working with. 
designing for interoperability. You know, in the past, you know, we're going to be buying a lot of middleware software to facilitate the exchange of data between solutions. You're going to have data dictionary libraries. You're going to have cloud migration tools. All of this stuff exists in the cloud right now. So you can actually not worry about your middleware. If you're going to migrate from SQL server in your data center to an SQL server in the cloud, that's one thing. There's a whole migration path for that, and there are tools that the cloud provider will give you. If you're going to migrate from MySQL to MSSQL, there's a whole migration tool set for that. All of this stuff is covered under the cloud right now for middleware, for data translation services. You can build those on your own using a serverless environment. If you are building a machine learning model or you're looking at log data or anything else, you can actually run each one of those log files through a preprocessor in Lambda or some other serverless environment, write it to your database, make sure it conforms to whatever you need for your machine learning model, right? And keep that all updated. There's a lot of things you can do on the fly now for data testing, modeling, languaging, AI, deep learning, all those things can go into this and you can do it really, really quick if you're designing for interoperability, data normalization, data cleaning, anything that doesn't meet the need goes over here in this system, anything that does meet whatever I need goes over here in this system and we can go ahead and we can train our systems to do whatever they're going to do. But designing for interoperability at this level is actually a really smart idea, especially if you want to start using any kind of machine learning or AI around logs, user behavior, user heat mapping, if you're tracking mouse movements or anything else. All that stuff can be captured, grabbed, and sent over, normalized, and then dropped into a database. And that's all going to be big, huge interoperability process. And then the other one is designed for maintainability. You're going to hear a lot of people um, talk about building it as functions. So generally, the most costly phase of software development is the maintenance phase. So you really want to break down your application into loosely coupled modules and then deploying those to, as an application across the, the entire cloud. So we do this now already on our desktop. If you go and you look at how a program is made, if you dig into it, you're going to see dynamic link libraries, you're going to see executables, you're going to see scripting, you're going to see a lot of other things. That's no different than what you're going to do in the cloud. The cloud just makes it a whole lot more scalable because now you can scale by component, which is a design change, a design change paradigm and how you go cloud native with an application. But if you can break everything down by component, this is my web page, this is my React or my other environment, this is my database, this is my network, this is my firewall, this is my system load balancer, this is my DNS. You can make these systems easier to maintain and a lot easier to spot the problem if there's a problem. So I really do think that this whole idea of loosely coupled modules and then deploying these solutions as applications really makes a whole lot more sense. Developers just need to change their paradigm a whole lot. Managers need to change their paradigm even more. Operations and administration needs to do a bunch of stuff. It's a completely different way of thinking, but it will really save you money in the long run. And then again, performance and scalability, making sure that you can either horizontal or vertical scale as needed when needed and how it's needed. And again, just design for however you want to do future integration of additional computing resources. Make sure you understand how your scaling model works. And then performance, right? So it's interesting what they kind of try to sell you to do, reduce the use of graphics on key pages. Sure, that will work on your dashboard, but you also have something called a content delivery network that will optimize the delivery of graphics or f video files or v audio files or anything else. So there are new ways and interesting ways of doing things so if you reduce the graphics on key pages, that's one thing to do, but you can also optimize your graphics file format. You can use a content distribution network. You can press large tech blocks before downloading text to a browser. This matters on a mobile device, right? Utilize data and application caching. Oh, definitely use database accelerators. Don't think you're not gonna. You're gonna be using Memcache, you're gonna use Redis, you're gonna be using DAX, any one of those, depending on what kind of database you've got. Fine-tuned disk and I.O. performance operations depends on what you're doing, right? So you may not need a whole lot of I.O. You may need a whole lot of I.O. It just depends on what your application is. When reduced when possible network operations, you're still going to have a semi-complex network on this one because you're going to be breaking things into virtual private clouds. You're still going to have a technique or the ideas of the DMZ versus the business environment. 
Um, you're still going to have ideas like VLANs. They just look a little different. They're still there, but you can probably reduce some of it down depending on what you've got. You can also make it more hideously complex. It's up to you. Fine-tune secure data communications and transactions. That's a big one, right? You can actually secure a lot of things in the cloud. Just make sure that if you do a distributed functional app across multiple things like um, Docker or through Lambda or through any of the other serverless environments and you're doing them as that, just make sure all the communications between devices are encrypted. Really make sure that you're good to go. Designing for price. This is where a lot of people get into trouble. Budgets are a fact of life. Companies don't want to spend money. Can't say as I blame them. I don't want to spend money. Can't say as I blame me. So as you design, you need to be aware that your design decisions have financial applications. If you turn around and say, I need a 10 zone, 10 region design system when you only really need two, you're paying more than you need to. The other thing that's really common when you get into designing for prices, they'll take a look at their current data center and they'll price and build a cloud application or a cloud system that's the same size as their data center and they didn't need it. They're only moving one application over, or they're only moving one business process flow over, and they're still going to keep their original data center. You only need the systems you need to run that particular business process. Some of that may come back to the actual data center that you actually own because you're dealing with a legacy system or you're dealing with some other legacy component that cannot be moved over to the, to the cloud. You've got to consider all these things because you can really overspend really fast. So again, this is why I really recommend having someone in your first initial one or two cloud deployments really understanding how design and architecture and cost and budget all work. You've got to consider all your short-term and long-term budget impacts. You've got to consider your tax implications of OPEX and CAPEX. You've got to make sure you've got some kind of return on this investment because you're going to spend a lot of money and you may spend a lot of money on software that maybe software as a solution service would have been a better choice. Again, really understanding all this stuff really makes a difference for your company. And then designing for privacy. So we all have privacy right now. GDPR is the global standard right now. It's in Europe. We have specific industry requirements for privacy like HIPAA, SOX, um, GLB. There's others out there. So we also have industry solutions like PCI DSS. You've got to make sure you're meeting all those as well. So you may have a legal, or regulatory, or industry standard process that you need to meet. Maybe you're trying to meet some ISO standard. All that needs to be understood as well before you move to the cloud, before you even get to the design phase. What are all of my regulatory requirements? And start building those in as you go through the process, either as internal controls, while you're building for audit, <coughs> and then anything else that you would normally do along those processes. But really understanding your regulatory environment will make your cloud deployment a lot easier. Then designing for portability. And you want to make sure that if you need to go to another data center, say you're really super popular and you decide to open up a third or fourth cloud region or cloud zone, and you want to make sure that you can just move all your stuff over, that's awesome, right? That's exactly what you're designing for. Make sure that you can do either as an AMI, an Amazon machine image, or some other image that you can just move it over to your new data center, because remember, cross-region data centers often do not talk to each other. You'll have to lift and shift some of your stuff over, and that's okay. If you're designing your own solutions, be aware of any API that are provider-specific that may not be available through other providers, especially if you're opening up in a foreign country, a country that may not have the ability to work with whoever your system service provider is. You may need to go through a VPN. You may need to do something else to make sure that your application is fully portable globally. And you got to start thinking about global. Designing for recovery. Make sure that if you did do a really nice, loosely coupled, decentralized application, that if something goes wrong, it will automatically start to recover, right? If there's something like a server failure, user error, power outage, if something goes wrong, you need to make sure that you can scale and recover accordingly. Your recovery design should should tie closely to your backup design, right? So essentially, anything you've got for business recovery, business continuity, make sure you've designed it in well. Designing for reliability, making sure that if something fails, it will automatically, automatically be replaced by something new. If you see something go down, it will automatically self-heal. 
that is another important part of this that's new we don't think about our data centers as self-healing but now we need to start thinking about our data centers and our code as self-healing that it knows when it's something bad has happened and it knows how to change it around and then response times again this is a super long lecture lots of neat things in here designing for response time make sure the user experience is kept in mind right make sure users are consistently taken care of users are conditioned to expect a fast system response our timing is no longer five seconds it's like one if your web page doesn't automatically load regardless of where you are man i've already moved on i don't even know why i tried to come to your web page kind of thing right a large percent of users will leave and never come back so make sure that your response times are like under three seconds make sure you're good to go and that's regardless of platform that's regardless of whether you're on the phone or you're on a tablet or you're on a desktop now the one good thing about the phone though is that sometimes people will understand why you're a little slow because they will go and they'll look at the, how many bars they've got at the top of their phone and so if they see one or two they'll expect a slower site but boy if they see five and you're slow though well, they're gone they're already gone Designing for robustness, and I like this one because it's the site's ability to continue operations in the event of an error or system failure, such as server or database error or something else. Make sure you've got part of this as your disaster recovery business continuity process because things will fail in the cloud and you may end up having a database that dies for whatever reason. You need to be able to promote from your primary database to a secondary database. You need to be able to promote that whether it's a read replica, whether you can then change it over to read write, you need to consider automating system resource utilization always, always. And then have alerts that, mon that let the system administrator know something has happened, but that it's self-healing and will take care of itself. Designing for security, I like this one the best because this is where I live. Software patch installations, patch management, cloud personnel, early awareness of security incidences, data privacy issues, jurisdictional issues, there are a lot of things that go into security. It is its own discipline in its own right. Cloud security really adds some interesting frontiers to how we're going to work in the cloud and the way we work in the cloud and why we work in the cloud. So you definitely want to keep up on this. And you definitely want to have people with the skills for this. But just be really aware that a lot of the things you do inside your company now, you're going to have to do in the cloud. The cool part is that you actually get to leverage the security of the provider and they probably are going to have better security people in their company and you can really leverage that expertise by using your scorecards by designing for the whole process to begin with and making sure that you audit your stuff and that if the company sends you a note saying hey you need to check into this that you actually do now it's unlikely that your cloud provider is going to fail if you're working with one of the big three, but you need to be aware of it if you're working with a smaller company, right? So make sure you've got something going on. There may be multi-tenant solution issues, and that is you may have a tenant that's misbehaving and the provider did not catch it fast enough. So just be aware that there is encryption all the way through this process that you need to do. Defense mechanisms for common low-level network attacks, denial of service is the most popular one. So there's just ways you can buy the service now. Make sure you're taking care of for denial of service. Now, what's interesting, too, data wiping for shared storage space, they're not going to let you walk into their data center. They're not going to let you run file wipe on their network attached storage. There are lots of things that are not going to happen. You have to take it on faith, and you have to take it on the fact that they have compliance. And if they say they're, they're SOC 2 or they say that they're HIPAA certified, whatever certification, that part of that is a data wiping process, right, especially for shared storage space. They also are probably going to have really, really, really good physical security. Those data centers will be locked off. Not just anyone can wander in. People will have biometrics. They'll have swipey cards. They'll have all the things that they need to have for physical security. And then designing for testability. This is another one of my big ones because it goes right into testing for auditability. It goes right into compliance and conformance. It goes into the heart of what we're doing. If you can test, you can monitor, you can manage, you can do all the things you want to do. You just have to make sure that you're actually allowing for your test people to do the things they need to do along the way. So you want to make sure that when you're building, you also have really good test harnesses and test framing for what you want to do. So the system's non-functional requirements are the most difficult to test because you're not really going to be able to test what happens if something happens, right? Or say a hard drive fails. What you can do, though, is you can shut down um, part of it and see what happens. 
will the system self-heal if you shut down the serverless environment that's using to pre-process data? What happens? You can do that with a test in the cloud that you really may not be able to do inside of a, a local data center because you designed it differently. So all those things you can design and test depending on how you did the functionality, um, how your methodology for test-driven design is being used and everything else. Build a solution that can satisfy the test. And again, that's either through test harness or whatever process you use. Designing for usability. Again, this is where we get into ADA. This is where we get into what we're doing um, to keep the user in mind because they're the ones that we're actually building this website for. Now that user can be internal, that user can be external, but because of the importance of meeting system usability requirements, many designers will model or create a prototype of the user experience. They may actually build a wireframe first that will literally walk them through the whole thing. And then from that wireframe, build out a alpha level, test it, build out a beta level, test it, do some AP testing along the way. So again, getting that early user feedback in the design process is super important. So making sure you've got people on hand for AB testing or alpha level or beta level testing is super important. Regardless of its internal, external customers, you need to make sure that whatever you build is functional enough for them to do what they need to do. So again, super long lecture, I apologize for that. There are lots in here, just lots of things to do. Um, so you do need to understand functional requirements, both functional and non-functional, green computing, middleware, non-functional requirements, portability, system requirements, and usability. All those things go into this. So you may need to play this video a couple of times because there's a lot in here. All right. Thanks for coming to this lecture, and I will see you in the next one.